Hi, Ajay. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. But thank you for having me, Guy. I appreciate being here, and it's a valuable resource that you're offering to, to your audience. Well, thank you. So before we uh, get into the main thing here, uh, could you please provide our audience with a little bit of background about yourself and, and your involvement in learning and development? And even more importantly, uh, tell us a little bit about you being a fellow CPA and what that's all about in Canada. <laughs> sure, Guy. I'm, again, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for having me uh, be part of this uh, as a small part to contributing to the value that you're offering to you know, the world <clears throat> and, and, these, and these insights. Well, as, as Guy mentioned, my name is Ajay Pangarkar and um, I'm, I'm an award-winning uh, performance and cost estimating strategist and a three-time three author uh, with my most recent book titled The Trainer's Balance Scorecard. Um, my experience, I bring to organizations over 25 years of experience in learning and development, a performance and financial management and strategic planning. Um, I also am a leading uh, LinkedIn learning author with a total of seven courses right now uh, and more to come, uh, four in the L&D space and three in the accounting side as well. I am a fellow of the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada. I'm also a fellow of the Certified Management Accountants, and I hold a Certified Training and Development Professional designation here in Canada. Um, my background, my, my formal background is I hold degrees in finance and accounting as long with a graduate degree in adult education. Uh, and it really, Guy, it's this combination that uh, between my business background, my business and finance background, and my experience in L&D, that brings me into a very unique position to bridge the chasm between operational stakeholders and learning practitioners. And so, like, if you ask me how I got into this, I mean, apart from getting that adult education degree and how to fit these pieces together, um, I sort of fell, I guess, like many in our generation, fell backwards into learning. It usually happened by happenstance. And the reason, the reason I successfully consult today was a result of an experience in my first management role. And I recall, I was managing a department, and I recall uh, my leaders, my stakeholders, my bosses, insisting that I send my staff repeatedly to, to training. And naturally, as you can appreciate, Guy, um, the money came out of my budget. And but I never saw any value when my staff came back. And so one time when I was told to send my staff to training, I refused. And so you think, you know, you don't refuse your boss, but I did. And I replied, they asked me why. And I said, replied, until someone can show me how my people will apply the skills from what they've learned from going to training back on the job and more so to improve the performance of my department, because that's what I'm being evaluated on. I'm not going to send them to training until somebody shows me that. And so 25 years later, um, I'm asked by leading stake, you know, uh, leading organizations or stakeholders from leading organizations to work with them in their learning departments to develop you know, value-driven and operationally focused learning initiatives and strategies. <clears throat> and I also get to travel to speak, you know, on how organizational knowledge and learning are now central and critical to the survival, if not the success of organizations. So in short, that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, well, let's now move on to the main event for this video. Would you please give our audience five to 10 minutes or 15 or 20, if, if that's uh, what, what it takes, uh, and give us your take on what to measure and how to measure the impact of instruction in an enterprise learning context, very much what you were just talking about in your intro. So what have you got for us? Sure. Um, so, Guy, you know, if I can share one phrase with the audience is that put this, ingrain this into your head. And it was, you know, authored, it was, made, it was popularized by Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits, but begin with the end in mind. And why do I say that is because too often um, learning practitioners tend to look at the learning itself. And, and that, that's what they're hired for to create, you know, wonderful learning experiences. Great. But that's not, that's the vehicle. That's not the end purpose for learning. And so when, when I say begin with the end in mind, I say, what is the objective of the organization? And so I get these blank stares where people say to me, okay, where do I find that? Well, it's easy because the answers are right in front of you. And I said, if you don't know where to start, the first thing you need to go to is your 
um, organization's mission and vision statements. Because just like in the military, the reason the mission exists is to focus every employee in the same direction. And within that mission statement, when crafted properly, shows you all of the elements that you can deconstruct to show where you need to focus your efforts in learning within the organization. So you can dissect a mission statement to the core operational areas and successful companies do that. They dissect their mission statement into core operational functions. Now, this is where I'm saying begin with the end in mind. Now we're still at the 100,000 foot level. Now I get off a learning practitioner and say, okay, well, great, thank you. I know what my mission is, but how do I get to those operational areas? Well, let's now work one step down from that. And so that's the level four part, right? We're looking here, uh, if we want to talk about Kirkpatrick. But then we look at the operational areas and say, okay, you know, there's production that has to do certain things. There's sales that have to do certain things. All these elements of the, of the company that fit into that mission have to do certain things. And so rather than be an order taker, I always say, get off your butts and get out of your cubicles and go meet with these operational departments because they're under significant pressure to meet performance um, objectives. And how do you find that? Well, within the framework of an organization, um, to translate that mission into operational, key operational objectives, they do something called a performance framework or what's often commonly referred to as a balanced scorecard. And in that balanced scorecard, there's, you know, and generically there's four key areas, what we call perspectives. Um, three of them are operational. Um, and one of them is called learning and growth and we call that enablement. And the key thing here is within that framework and it's cascaded down. So it starts at a corporate level, uh, a very high level. It breaks down the mission into the key operational areas. And then it becomes more granular. So each department has their own performance framework that goes down. Even some companies I worked with go down to their employees. Employees have their own performance uh, scorecards. And these are all tied up to the mission. So if I go in, I, the first thing I ask for in the department is say, show me what performance, metric, performance metrics you have. And they'll show me. And I say, okay, tell me, let me learn about your business. What pressures are you facing to be able to achieve these performance expectations? You may have to raise, I don't know, maybe reduce product defects by 10% in the next six months, or maybe you have to increase sales by 20% in the next quarter, uh, or whatever, whatever the metric is. I'm being very generalistic here, Guy, but you know, you can be, they are, they are very precise. So I always say when you get to that stage, now we're getting into the 50, 30 to 50,000 foot level of analysis. But where we are now is we're learning about their business. We're becoming operational partners. We're not, we're not order takers anymore. We're actually working with them. And we're learning about what they need to do to make their business successful so they can impress the next, impress the, the next level of the organization and at the corporate level and eventually help the company meet, meet its mission. That being said, now I can get more granular. Once they tell me, okay, well, I'm gonna use an example. I always use a production example because everybody tends to go to sales. Production says, you know, we, uh, we, have, um, we have to increase our output uh, by a certain percentage, but also we're getting a lot of returns. Customer service says that we have a lot of product defects and that we have to reduce that amount by a certain percentage. And each percentage translates into a dollar amount of savings or efficiencies or whatever, right? There's that return for the department. So I say to them, okay, well, is it a process issue, right? Is it something that is that because your processes are running efficiently? If it is, then maybe I need to step back as learning because it's, 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 not, it's really truly an operational issue. And I have to have the courage for that to say as learning, it's, I don't have any input here. But at the same time, if it's an operational issue, maybe it's a people issue within that operational issue. And then I have to say, okay, what part, why do you believe your people are not functioning properly? You have to be that therapist, that investigator to dig, to find out the true cause or root cause. And you and I both have been trained in root cause analysis or what a lot of people call Kaizen. Um, we've been trained to ask the why several times. And L&D people need to ask that question several times before they come to an implicit conclusion. Just because you know we train and employ better on equipment doesn't mean they're gonna reduce defects. The defect level might still be there at the end and then we're accused of not doing good training. Well, that's because we didn't get the root cause. Maybe the, the root cause was equipment is malfunctioning and it's not the employee's fault. Maybe the root cause is, is a person problem. Maybe it's because they're doing the certain procedures in the wrong steps and that's causing some defect issues. And then we're gonna help them correct that. And they don't know that, but we're gonna help them correct that. And that's part of a training issue. 
whatever the case, now we're getting very tangible. So when you get into this performance framework, you see those metrics. And I always tell LD people, don't develop your own metrics. Like, and we have this chronic need to create things uh, that don't impress anybody. And I say, rather than reinvent the wheel, why don't you take their metrics and prove to them that you're adding value to what they're doing? So if you were told to reduce, de- if they're, they're told, sorry, to reduce defects by 5% in the next quarter, and you even help move the needle with training by helping them reduce that defect rate by say 1% or 1.5%, and they didn't reach your 5%, but at least you helped them move that needle in the right direction. Well, this, that still translates in a significant whatever, dollar savings, efficiency, whatever it may be, to that department and their stakeholders will be very happy and you'll get cred- some credit for it. But here's where I have to caution l and people. Another fault that we have, and, and, I, and I'm, I use this tough love guy a little bit and people accuse me of being too harsh, but we tend to like to want, we're like that child who wants the total attention and credit from their parents. And we need to stop that because we are one part of the cog in the big machinery that is affecting the output. If you wanna take credit for that one or two or 3% improvement in defect reduction, good. But if it goes south, you better be able to stand up and take the blame as well. Because if, if you wanna take the success and ignore everything else that goes on around in business, then you better take the, the, the sword that comes out, you to chop off your head because that's gonna come back. And so be careful, recognize the fact that you're one component to help improve the process. And you need to acknowledge that with that operational partner saying, look, we're gonna do our best to do this. But if there's still a problem with the machinery or a problem with the process, nothing in our training is going to improve that number. You know, we'll make that person better and make them more skilled, but la di da, who cares? Because at the end of the day, you're still gonna have an issue. And so, at the end of the day, you're going to have to have the courage, number one, first. So let me, let's make this very tangible for people right now. You get it. You find a performance framework uh, for that department or that operational. Basically, get off your butts, get into them, talk to them, learn about their business. And because just like my story before, until that somebody proves to me that my people coming back into my department will improve the value and performance of my organization, they're thinking the same way. Remember, you're taking their money and, and they want to see value for that money. So ask them what their business is about, investigate, ask the right questions, find out their performance metrics, and then say, how can I connect and help people in that metric to become better? Now, the time we have together, guy, I'm not going to, you know, solve, you know, <laughs> world peace here. But uh, at the end of the day, really what it's about is you have to investigate and ask the right questions. And I always used to say to people, look, you know, None of this is really rocket science. And I'm try- not trying to denigrate l and This is n- not more complicated than it actually is. All the a- It's like when I was in school, if the teacher gave me all the answers up front before the test, I just needed to know what questions they were going to ask, right? I needed to ask the right questions to allocate the, the answers. Same thing here. The organization ha- is giving you all the answers. You just need to be able to ask the right questions. And the more questions you ask, the more information you get. Isn't that what learning is about, is to discover and ask questions and learn about what they're doing before we make conclusions? And at the end of the day, once you do this, and I've seen this repeatedly over and over again, once you become an integral component and prove the value of learning within those type of contexts and affect those metrics in a positive manner, you are now seen as a valued resource to the organization. And I know some people are gonna be, you know, screaming at the camera right now, listening to me saying, you know, well, Ajay, you know, my stakeholders don't understand. I just, you know, and I just saw a thread today about how stakeholders think they know more about learning than learning practitioners. And the companies I work for or work with, I should say, um, are ones who don't need me. I mean, I can name companies. and I'm not going to say that I work with them or not because I can't disclose that, but you can look at their companies who have integrated learning into their success and they do exactly what I'm telling you to do. So the Toyotas of the world, the Starbucks of the world. Um, you know, they don't think training and learning is an afterthought. It's a fully integrated um, component into their performance management framework. And they're not an afterthought and they're not order takers. And these people are tied in exactly into the operational process. So let me share a very tangible example. I'm always impressed when I go to Starbucks. Um, when I order coffee or I see somebody in front of me customize an already customized coffee, right? I mean, Starbucks already sells you customized coffees and you have some person coming up there customizing it even further. 
Now you have to think to yourself, I know nobody really thinks about this when they're ordering at Starbucks, but I do these weird things. I sit there in amazement and I watch the baristas do exactly what they need to do. And within two to three minutes, there's a product at the end of the counter that is accurate to my specifications for the value I paid for. And I'm happy with that. But people forget what it takes to do that consistently, not in just that store, but in stores all across America, all across North America and all around the world to be consistent. I can go to Paris, France, not that I would order coffee at Starbucks in Paris, by the way, but I go to Paris, France, and I order a Starbucks coffee, the same one that I ordered in, say, in San Francisco, and they'll be 98% identical, okay? And I will not know, notice a difference. And that's because, that's because the metrics behind it, the productivity metrics, um, performance metrics of getting that coffee out, how it's produced, and then the learning that's embedded in it to get those baristas to do it properly and consistently to meet those metrics, that's how well integrated learning is within that organization. So don't make no mistake, none of these companies do this by accident. These, this is a very important process. So if I can summarize, and I know I don't want to belabor this anymore, but summarize, begin with the end in mind. If you don't know where to start, look at the mission statement and then work backwards. Deconstruct that mission statement into the performance framework. Look for your balanced scorecard or any type of scorecard within the organization that outlines it then take that corporate scorecard and break it down into the departments and then get off your butts. I was going to say another word, but get off your butts and find, do your investigation on these scorecards for those departments and find out those performing metrics and then go meet with these departments and say, Hey, you need to achieve certain uh, objectives here. How can I help? Right. And then they'll tell you the problem, be the therapist, let them sit on the couch and tell them, tell you their problems. And then try within those answers to uh, dissect what, where you can insert the value you're having to offer. So value, that's what you need to do. And if you help to move that needle in collaboration with other elements within business, guess what? You're going to be seen as a hero. Even if you move it by, you know, a smidge. I don't know what a smidge is, but, you know, a very small amount. That translates into significant savings, profitability, whatever it is within the organization. And, and I'll just share, there's another trick that I share, by the way, to find out problems. But this is, comes from more my finance and accounting background, if, if you allow me to share, Guy, very quickly. Because of my finance and accounting background, I, um, I asked for financial statements of the department. <laughs> so so it's, it's funny to see the reaction of L&D people when I go into these companies and they, I say to them, give me uh, the financial statements of the department we're working with, you know, whatever, production, whatever. And they'll look at me, why? We called you in for learning. And I said, yeah. And so what I do is I do an analysis because the numbers speak to me. I can, I can, because numbers are the end result of every organization, financial output. And I working backwards in the analysis of that financial analysis, uh, all relate back to qualitative elements. So if I see certain discrepancies and trends within the financial numbers, I can work backwards and ask why what's happening. And I can actually pinpoint areas where they need to improve. And that's where I became becoming like a sniper. I hate to use that analogy, but it's very appropriate. I become like a sniper and I target exactly the areas I need to do. So I'm not a shotgun anymore and trying to train everybody and anybody. I'm very targeted improving those areas. And so those are two taxes that I do to, to make that happen. Now, if uh, as a shameless plug, I, uh, I've written a book, I hope it's still available to a certain extent, <laughs> The Trainer's Balance Scorecard. And that book speaks to the first half, understanding how companies come up with these strategies and the linkages within the operations. And then the second part of the book discuss exactly what I just spoke about, the connection of learning within the operational context and making these things happen. So Guy, I will leave it there. I think I've said a lot. I hope I didn't go too much over your time, but uh, if people want to ask me any questions, I encourage them to reach out to me and I'll be happy to help them out. Well, Ajay, thank you so much for sharing that with us and your insights. And I will put links in the show notes uh, to your book and to your website and uh, other contact information that you want to share. And uh, hopefully people will follow up with you. But uh, I thank you for your time and, and for what you've offered us here today. Thanks. Thank you, guys.